It's my turn. <laughs> Let's see, House of Cards reference, check. <laughs> West Wing reference, check. Worst career decision ever, check. <laughs> okay, I can go on with everything else I came to say, which is mostly, by the way, preaching to the choir. Thank you, President Kerwin. Thank you, Dean Romzek, for inviting me to take a few minutes of your time. And thank you to the class of 2014. Yeah. And thanks to mom, too. I have given and sat through just enough commencement speeches to realize that you did not come here to see me. I know, I understand. There are parties to be had. And you will like more of what I have to say if I keep it short. So that's fine because I only have a few points to make and I hope you will hear them if only because after President Kerwin's charge to you in a few moments, this will likely be the last academic lecture that you will have to sit through for a while. <laughs> I know my audience. My words are probably no more deep or prescient than the lectures you have given yourselves as you prepare to be here today. They're probably no more optimistic or pessimistic than the advice that your parents will give. But I have the platform for a few minutes, so I get to tell you what I wish my commencement speaker had told me mm, years ago. It's okay to be unsure, still, of what you really want to do next. It is perfectly fine, in fact, it is advisable to change your mind if you think you do know. And it is essential, really, that if you need a course correction at some point, that you take it, now or later. Off-ramps are just another opportunity to do it right or to do it better. The best part of today is that you can celebrate achievement without sinking into career concrete. Nothing is set in stone, not yet. I say yet because the rest of us have left you quite a challenge. And the public affairs degree you take with you today obligates you to do something about it. For example, it's fine for all of us to tut-tut about Benghazi or to pray for the rescue of the Nigerian schoolgirls or to hope for an increase in the minimum wage or the right to pray or the right to carry a gun. But because you've chosen a degree with a very precise goal attached to it, it's on you to do more. It's on you to do more than attach a hashtag to a sentiment. It's easy, your friends and your followers and people you really don't know not in agreement, bring back the girls woohoo, and then they go out to the club. But it's on you to motivate, to annoy, or even to become your people's representative so that laws can change and lives can be improved. It's on you to be a voice for the voiceless, to treat your degree as something more than a truly impressive piece of wall art. Now, this can be a tough slog. Polls tell us that most Americans don't care about what's going on in Washington, and most of the time, who can blame them? But as we watch scandals unfold, real ones, not the Olivia Pope type, <laughs> and we brace for another round of expensive and consequential elections just around the corner, we are reminded that in spite of it all, Americans still do sort of look to Washington reflexively, to government, to address the big questions, the questions about war and peace, and health and welfare, and our very future as a democratic republic. But first, we have to believe in the power of us to make us better. You're about to get a degree from a school that was created 80 years ago to train federal workers to carry out the New Deal. That's huge, no pressure there. It was here in part that the idea of public service got a reputation as an idealistic thing to do, whether that meant studying in the classroom or protesting in the streets. Getting involved in the world around you was kind of romantic. And it was from here that you could often smell the taint that made politics and public service seem for so many like the last thing they would want their children to do. Better to let them grow up to be cowboys. But with your help, the sheen is returning. By earning this degree, you've cut a deal with the rest of us that you will give back more than you get. 
You could have passed on the opportunity to dedicate yourself to public service. Most of you had other places to go or other places to hide. But you are here today because there is work to do. You've chosen to take it on, to rise above self-absorption, to appreciate that there is more world out there than contained in your handheld device. Let me tell you an only in Washington story. One day, I was walking down Pennsylvania Avenue. This is one of these only in Washington stories because I was on my way to a meeting with a colleague at the White House, right? You can't say that everywhere. I was running late. I was looking down at my phone, texting furiously. I'm on my way. I misjudged the curb, and I fell flat on my face in the middle of the street. I was humiliated and helped to my feet by a uniformed Secret Service agent. And a man who stopped, helped me up, picked up my phone, which had gone this way, my glasses, which had gone this way, and turned out to be like an assistant secretary of commerce, only in Washington. And when I thought I had escaped my humil humiliation, he turned to me and said, love the show. <laughs> and gave me his card, <laughs> only in Washington. Worse yet, after I was held back to my feet, I realized if I had only looked up, I would have seen my colleague waiting for me less than a block away, right in the front of the Northwest Gate. Instead of texting, I could have waved. I could have been spared the humiliation and the skin knees. Don't do what I did, fixing your eyes on the ground, only looking as far as the next step. You may get where you're going, but it will surely take you a long time. Or like me, you could fall on your face and miss the scenery along the way. The detours that take you to some places that are unexpected and the setbacks that teach you things you didn't need, know you needed to know. Because it's through these experiences which require you to take your eye off the screen and look around you that you learn to become what I call the necessary voice. There are a lot of people out here talking, tweeting, blogging, ranting. Some of you may be doing that right now. <laughs> tweeting, I hope, not ranting. Not while I'm speaking. You can talk about me after I leave. <laughs> but in our world, there's no shortage of debate and disagreement, which is OK. I generally believe that when it comes to the public square, sound beats silence. But in that welter of noise, there is a way to be the necessary voice. The person who searches for the middle ground and knows how to articulate it. The person who calls racism and sexism and classism by its name every day, not just when a rich sports team owner decides that he's going to say something outrageous. You can be the person who turns toward, not away from the chance to rise above the fray. And you can be the person who trains yet another generation to do better at it than you did. I was drawn to journalism because of the need to be the necessary voice, not to force my opinions on others, but to broaden the stage for the debate. And along the way, I have to say, there were some perks. I was played by Queen Latifah twice on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Honorary degrees are nice, but that was really cool. <laughs> Your necessary voice can invest in the power of possibility. You can relish the unexpected. You can claim the path you never really intended to take. And there's a lot of work to be done. Only a select few, however, are willing and able to do it, and you are now among them. With this degree in hand, there are options and there are choices out there for you that others don't have. But you have to look up to see them off that screen. There's information to be had, facts to share, solutions to discover, but you have to look up. There is time we have, time we lack, and the ability to take advantage of both. The clock is on the wall, but you have to look up. That means there are risks to be taken. Looking up sometimes mean your head, your, means that your head is so far in the clouds that you don't see the grounding reality at your feet or in my case, Pennsylvania Avenue. And there is this. You don't always get what you want. I believe that would make a great song. <laughs> anyway. But you still have to take the risks, or it's not worth it. You have to choose hope over despair. This is why I do. 
I don't live in China or Turkey or Zimbabwe, where they shut down your newspaper or your television station when you speak up, especially when you criticize the government. I don't live in places where writing the truth can get you killed or imprisoned. I live in a country where the First Amendment provides a cloak, but also a responsibility. If I were a teenage girl in Pakistan who spoke up for girls' education, I would, risk the, I, would risk, I would run the risk of being shot in the head by a Taliban gunman. If I just wanted to go to school at all in northern Nigeria, I would run the risk of being kidnapped. It's important to be reminded how easily we can be denied simple, obvious opportunity, how low the ceilings can get, and how much fortitude it makes it takes to refuse to accept the limits that others place on you. But you now have the skills to transcend those limits. Whose stories can you tell? Whose voices are not being heard? Who gets to decide which stories and voices get ignored? And what are you willing to do about it? Personally, I have a flat spot right in the front of my head from trying to break down walls my entire career, forcing diversity of thought and opinion into newsrooms and onto the air. Whatever else you do with your lives, I hope you remember to fight those battles too. First comes the achievement. You've done that here today, pretty big achievement. You've had access to a remarkable, wonderful, educational diving board from which to leap into your lives and chase those dreams. But next comes the responsibility part. You are responsible for your language, for your behavior, for the paths you choose to pursue, and the honor with which you pursue them. If I ever have to write a story about any one of you, I want it to be a good one. <laughs> that means you. <laughs> then comes the execution, follow through. There is so much that this world needs that can be provided by committed people like you, folks who have been given the opportunities so many others haven't. It's not enough to sit on the sidelines. And along the way, I might add, don't get too wedded to the shoulds in life. You know, you should be married. You should be in graduate school. You should make a lot of money or you should do what's expected of you. You should change the world. Instead, devote these next few weeks and months of your life to thinking of the coulds. What could you do? How could you go about doing it? Today I'm asking you to make and keep a few promises, not to me or to your family or friends, which is fine, but really to yourself. Promise to find a mission for your life if you haven't already. Promise to fix and explain and investigate and understand. Promise to care about more than yourself to affect the lives of those around you. Promise to use what you've learned here at AU about potential, the potential of rebuilt bridges and of healing words, the potential to create new relationships where none existed before. And don't forget to laugh along the way because it's the only way any of that can come together. You can't be happy, no matter what Pharrell says, unless you're laughing, especially at yourself. If you have learned all that, if you make and keep even half of the promises that I have instructed you to, we'll all be the better for whatever effort you make. And you will make us all very, very proud. Families, faculty, graduates, thank you for the honor of including me in the class of 2014. I like to think I still have a few promises to keep as well. Enjoy the rest of your wonderful day. <laughs>